good morning. We, the, we're going to get started. I'm Leon Platanias, and I'm the director of the Lurie Cancer Center. And uh, I want to thank all of you for being here today. Uh, as you know, nanotechnology uh, is evolving quickly. It's, a very, uh, it's something that um, we are very fortunate uh, to be one of uh, the leaders here at Northwestern with uh, the Institute for Nanotechnology. And, and this is an area particularly important for the Cancer Center. And we have actually with, um, uh, with Chad this uh, CCNE, the uh, Nanotechnology Excellence uh, Grant, and one, we are one of the very few places in the country that have that. So this is a very exciting area. It's a major strength at Northwestern, and uh, it, it, it is becoming rapidly very important for clinicians. So I'm really grateful for Chad for organizing that and other people that work with him. And uh, I hope you enjoy a very exciting program today. Sad? All right. Very good. Well, thank you, Leon, uh, for the introduction. Uh, and thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you, Will and Margie, wherever you are. There's Will. I'm not sure if Margie came in, but thank you all for setting this up. Uh, so I'm going to start. Uh, and I'll have about 15 or 20 minutes to give a basic overview of nanotechnology translational nanotechnology and, uh, and some of the concepts of nanotechnology that hopefully uh, will give you an introduction. Uh, and then after I finish speaking, we have three uh, wonderful scientists, physician scientists, uh, that will present to you some really wonderful examples of, of nanotech and translational nanotech that are ongoing here uh, at Northwestern and now at, at UCLA as well. So Dr. Amy Paller, Mary Hendricks, uh, and Dean Ho all will present their work uh, after I'm finished. So. Let's start off, um, and it's very appropriate. I don't know if this was put here on purpose, but here's a nano air insulation coat. Um, so <laughs> an advertisement for once. I don't know if that's on purpose, but uh, it's appropriate um, as we go forward. So maybe we'll understand, or maybe understand why they're calling that a nano air insulation coat, although it's not obvious to me. Um, so let's all, first of all, get on the, the right length scale. Okay, um, so nanotechnology, right, is the science of things that exist on the nanoscale. Uh, so let's first all get on, 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 uh, on the same length scale together. Uh, so this is just a big ruler. You can, you can, can think of this uh, slide showing a big ruler. Uh, on the top, we have the meter length scale. So this is a length scale, of course, that we're all familiar with. We can see and interact with things that are on the meter length scale. So for instance, people, uh, very tall people like basketball player Yao Ming. Uh, he exists and we exist on the meter length scale. Uh, and then if we go all the way down to the angstrom length scale, so this is 1 times 10 to the minus 10th meters, or 1 100 trillionth uh, of a meter. Uh, and this is the length scale uh, of individual atoms. right? So these are, the, for instance, the atomic radius of, of an individual atom on the periodic scale, whether it's gold or carbon or nitrogen or anything else uh, typically exists down here in the angstrom uh, length scale. So let's go back up and we'll start working our way down. So we have meters, we're all familiar with it. Then we end up with millimeters, right? So the millimeters, we can also relate to millimeters because we can see on a ruler uh, how big a millimeter is and things that are that big we can see, right? So a width, the width of a human hair, for instance, is about one millimeter, one thousandth of a meter. Uh, and then we go down uh, a little bit further uh, and we end up on the micron, so one millionth of a meter. Uh, length scale. And so over here we see uh, blood cells, right? So these are cells in the peripheral blood, formed elements of the peripheral blood, red blood cells, white blood cells. So these things, on average, uh, are 10 microns or so in diameter. So um, we can't see those with the naked eye, but we can relate to those things if we look at them, for instance, through uh, a light microscope. We can see them. Then we go down a little bit further in size. And so staying with the theme of biology, uh, we end up with things down here that are uh, viruses, for instance. So viruses exist on the nanometer length scale. So some viruses um, it are about 100 nanometers or so in diameter. Okay, And it's harder to relate to those things. It's harder to image those things because light microscopes can't see those uh, typically because they are smaller than uh, the wavelength of light at which you can look through a microscope, a conventional one, and see these things. So you need special tools to actually visualize viruses because they're so small. 
Uh, and then we go down a little bit further in, in length scale, and we have the building blocks, right? The polymers, if you will, the heteropolymers that make up things like viruses and human cells. So these are polymerizations of phospholipids, for instance, that make cell membranes. These are polymerizations of, 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 of uh, nucleic acids, right, that make up RNA and DNA, the things that allow one to pass genetic information from one generation to the next. And for cells ultimately like proteins, right, which are also polymers, right, the functional workhorses of human cells um, are proteins. And all of those things, of course, are natural nanoparticles. These are biologic nanoparticles that nature builds um, to allow us to ultimately function. The individual molecules of those that build up nucleic acids, proteins, et cetera, an individual amino acid, for instance, that's something that exists on the angstrom length scale. Um, so those are kind of the biological things, right? So that kind of puts us in this framework. Uh, and these are all synthetic things, right? So these are synthetic things, things that we can actually build. Uh, and the focus of nanotechnology is to build things that exist between about one and 100 nanometers. So strictly defined, nanotechnology is the science of synthesizing things that are between, or at least have one dimension between one and 100 nanometers, okay? So if you think about that, if we relate that to the biological length scale, it's really making things that are interacting with, uh, for instance, human cells that are far, far larger, right? So these are, we're making things, right, to interact really at the length scale of individual molecules, individual proteins and nucleic acids that ultimately are assembled, uh, self-assembled in amazing ways to make human cells. And so here's some examples of those. So uh, up here we have a, a, a circuit board, right? So that's big, we can see that. If we go down in length, here's a really beautiful star-shaped nanoparticle, uh, a gold-shaped one. I'm assuming that's one that uh, was made in, in Terry Odom's lab up on the North Campus. So this is a spiky gold uh, nanoparticle, and it has uh, a size of about 13 nanometers or so. So in fact, even smaller than some of the viruses that, that we're talking about. Here's an even smaller nanostructure. So this is a, a metal nanoparticle, um, a lot like, for instance, a five nanometer diameter gold particle that we use a lot in my laboratory. Here you can see the individual atoms uh, that make up uh, this particle. Uh, and you can see it's about seven or so nanometers in diameter. And, and uh, we can go even further down. This is a carbon nanotube. This is an allotrope of carbon. Uh, so an amazing uh, nanostructure with amazing properties. Um, this thing is completely made of carbon, and this black overlay are the individual carbon atoms that you're, that you're visualizing there. And so again, the notion is, can we make things can we make things that exist in this nanometer length scale and then use them in some way to interact with, in our case, biological entities in order to do something useful? And those are really the three main things of nanotechnology. Make things that exist on this length scale, characterize them, chemically characterize them, and ultimately use, some, use them to do something useful. So a brief history uh, of nanotechnology. How did we get to where we are now? So we'll start here. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's not us that, that were the first to realize how amazing the properties of nanoparticles are. So one of the things, one of the big themes of nanotechnology is if you take bulk materials, for instance, a gold, a gold bar is a good example, and you miniaturize the atoms that make up the gold bar, the gold atoms, and make nanoparticles out of them, they start to have new properties. And that's a critical piece, a uh, critical component of nanotechnology is that as you begin to miniaturize things, they begin to take on new properties, and they begin to use those properties uh, uh, to, to do something useful. And so gold nanoparticles are a good example. So 400 uh, AD, people realized that the properties of nanoparticles were very, very interesting. So gold nanoparticles floating around in solution have a beautiful gold color. They don't look like the gold that you see, for instance, in a, in a gold brick or a gold piece of gold jewelry. Uh, they look red. And although people, uh, in 400 uh, AD didn't realize that they were gold nanoparticles. They understood that the properties were very unique. So for instance, they could take this cup uh, and they could take uh, the, the glass and they could impregnate that glass with gold nanoparticles, right? And if you shine light through it, the gold nanoparticles in there scatter the light and it makes the glass look red. The neat part about that is they could take those same nanoparticles and they could put it in glass and put them in stained glass windows and cathedrals and churches. And what they realized was light could continue beaming through that window for hundreds of years and the particles would never become less red, right? The, 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 the light would never bleach, right, the nanoparticles that were in the glass and so they were extremely stable uh, and they, sat, they had really neat optical properties. They turned the, the glass red 
uh, and, and that was, you know, of course, very pretty. Um, but they didn't know what it was. They couldn't see what, what these particles were. They just knew they had neat properties. Um, and so Faraday, in 1856, Michael Faraday, uh, he also understood uh, that the gold nanoparticles had, uh, and, and miniaturizing things from the bulk to the nanoscale, uh, imparted to them uh, mat the materials, very interesting properties. And so this is a collection of colloidal gold nanoparticles that Michael Faraday synthesized at the time. And, hit, and the big um, concept that, that he put forth was the one that I just mentioned to you. As you miniaturize things from the bulk to the nanoscale, they begin to take on new properties. For instance, the gold nanoparticles appeared red instead of appearing gold uh, in solution. Now, he also didn't understand and couldn't image exactly what he had in, the, in his vials, but he knew that the properties were different. So we come all the way up to 1959, um, which a lot of people say was really the, the, the beginning of, of nanotechnology uh, in, in the way that we think about nanotechnology. Uh, and it really started with uh, a man by the name of Richard Feynman. So Richard Feynman was a physicist at Caltech. Uh, and he gave a speech um, in 1959, um, uh, a New Year's Eve speech, as it turns out, where basically he said, there's plenty of room at the bottom. The name of the speech is There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. You can go online. You can get this speech. You can, you can read the whole thing. Um, and basically, he said it was this invitation to a new field of science, the field of science where we begin manipulating matter atom by atom right, to create things, nanoscale structures with useful properties. And so he talks in his speech a lot about miniaturization in order to store more information. right? So computers store more information. And as we're able to miniaturize, uh, the size of the information uh, storing parts of a computer. Of course, we went from walls of transistor tubes and, and huge computers to all the laptops that are sitting out, out on the desks uh, in front of us. Uh, but he said that's, that's, um, that's just the beginning. Of course, we can continue to miniaturize things. We can, we can potentially, there's no physical reason why we cannot manipulate individual atoms, put them exactly where we want to make designer things, whatever those things are to store more information, uh, which is one of the things he talks about here. Uh, why can't we write the entire 24 volumes of the encyclopedia right, on the head of a pin? Right? We should be able to put atoms in, order, in, in, in place to form words. And the physical space uh, that is available on the head of a pin should be plenty to write, for instance, all of the volumes of the encyclopedia of Britannica on the inside, of, on the top of a single pin. There should be plenty of room to do that. That was one example. Actually, he had a, a graduate student in his lab when he gave this talk uh, that also said, why can't we think of ways to quote unquote miniaturize the doctor, right? There should be a way where we could swallow a nanoparticle and a smart nanoparticle and that nanoparticle, that nano doctor should be able to float through the bloodstream, identify areas of, of concern, for instance, a growing tumor. Uh, he used a heart valve, a faulty heart valve as an example, um, and then repair that uh, and then leave the body um, uh, with, with, uh, with no side effects. And so these were things that they were thinking then, uh, but of course it took us a little while to get to the point where we could even begin to conceive of, of, of things like that. And the reason was, in 1959, a lot of the tools weren't available. So one of the big things in nanotechnology as well is tools needed to become available to the scientists doing nanotechnology in order to understand uh, how to manipulate matter at this length scale. Right? So as those tools developed, uh, we began to understand better uh, what we could do with nanotechnology. So in, in 1986, uh, as atomic force and scanning tunneling microscopes became available, these are microscopes that enable one to look at individual atoms uh, and produce some of the pictures that I showed you before and also to produce this picture. Uh, here, this is a giant magnetic uh, magnetoresistor. Uh, you can see 50 nanometers, a very, very small structure. Here you see, uh, by using the tip of a very, very sharp tip, an atomically sharp tip, uh, on the end of a, a, a scanning tunneling microscope to manipulate individual atoms into a circle in this case, and they were able to observe very interesting quantum effects by doing that, uh, showing that you can begin to orient individual molecules now uh, in order to make and understand very interesting things. So they were awarded a Nobel Prize for that. Another Nobel Prize in, in 1996 for imaging this very unique nanostructure. So this is C60, so this is called Buckyball. So this is a uh, a sphere of 60 carbon atoms uh, that they characterized and were ultimately able to image uh, in, in 1996. So it took a long time for the tools to be developed to begin to manipulate matter and image matter that people were making that existed on this length scale. And that was also 
that was also uh, a Nobel Prize uh, winning finding. So then we come up to 2000, right? So we're beginning to make things that exist on the, on the nanoscale. The question is, can we be able to man manipulate them and ultimately use them uh, to do useful things? Uh, and of course, in order to drive this, in order to really stimulate this, um, in 2000, here's, here's an address by, by, by then President Clinton, uh, who said um, that investing in nanotechnology is a, is a good idea, basically. And he said, Some, soon research will bring us devices that can translate foreign languages as fast as you can talk, so speed of, of, of uh, new devices, materials 10 times stronger than steel. So he's talking about materials for, in this case, manufacturing and other applications, but of course, some of those materials may be used in, in biomedicine. And molecular computers the size of a teardrop, right? Um, this is unbelievable to me, right? So these are amazing things that people were thinking about uh, at the time, and investing in that future uh, was something that became very important. So information processing, superior materials, molecular electronics. So these are just different fields, of course, that nanotechnology has and may have uh, continued to have an impact in. And in this room, we're most interested in, in bio biology and, and in medicine. So after 2000, with all of these new tools and an infusion of money, for instance, uh, through the National Nanotechnology uh, Initiative. Uh, uh, Leon, when he was up here, he mentioned the CCNE. So the Centers for Cancer and Nanotechnology Excellence uh, were initiated uh, at about that time. Northwestern uh, was awarded one of the first CCNEs. We were also able to get that CCNE uh, renewed. So we were uh, very lucky to be an institution with two Centers of Cancer and Nanotechnology uh, Excellence. Um, we're going for the third uh, as we speak. Um, and what happened was, people began designing nanoparticles, designer nanoparticles, right? Using nanoparticles of different sizes and shapes, ones that they could manipulate uh, and synthesize, and began decorating them with all types of different biological ligands in order to, so, so that they can begin to interact with uh, biological materials like, for instance, human cells. And so here's just an example. I'll come to this example in, in the coming slide, and we'll talk about some of the different approaches people have used uh, for, for making nanoparticles as, diagnostics and, uh, as diagnostic probes and ultimately uh, as new therapies. And in 2008, because of all of the, ex the explosion and growth of nanotechnology, there's in fact a new prize, it's called the Kavli Prize, given specifically for advances in nanotechnology, understanding how important that they will be going forward in all different types of fields, including uh, biomedicine. So here's some examples of nanoparticles that you will encounter uh, when you delve into the literature or you begin uh, considering, uh, use, consider using uh, nanoparticles uh, for your work. So this is a and, and this basically is a kind of a relative size representation of some of the ones that uh, are available. So this is a gold uh, silicon oxide nano shell, 150 nanometers in diameter, has amazing properties. We'll talk about some of them uh, and using them as therapies in, in the coming slide. Here's that carbon nanotube that I mentioned, one nanometer or so in thickness. Uh, very interesting properties. A gold nanoparticle, uh, specific nanoparticle that I'm uh, partial to. Uh, this is a 13 nanometer diameter one, although you can make them in multiple different sizes. And then you have semiconducting nanocrystals, or quantum dots, right? So these are, um, these are fluorescent uh, nanoparticles, two nanometers or so in diameter, with beautiful optical properties uh, that can be used for different uh, biological applications. So nanoparticles in biomedicine. So what are some of the different applications? And so I mentioned you know, diagnostics, right? So using the unique properties of nanomaterials and nanoparticles to begin to do diagnostics uh, in, in a new way, uh, improving upon uh, perhaps some of the shortcomings of modern uh, diagnostic uh, technologies. Delivery agents, right? So using the particle, for instance, as a scaffold to put targeting agents on the outside, right? Agents, the molecules, antibodies are a good example that target specific cell types and carry to those specific cell types Imaging agents, right? So if you want to image a tumor, it's a good example. You can put an antibody on the surface of a particle. The particle's full of uh, gadolinium if you want to image it with MRI, and you send the particle into a, uh, an in vivo system, into uh, an animal model. It seeks out those tumor cells and lights those up so that you can image them. The other thing that you may be able to do is put therapeutic agents on the, uh, on the surface, perhaps even on the same particle. So in addition to delivering and uh, identifying specific cell types based upon cell surface or a particle surface and cell surface recognition elements, you can put drugs in there. And those drugs can be anything from chemotherapeutic drugs to um, anti-inflammatory agents to nucleic acid type drugs that you would like to carry to that tumor, to use cancer as the example. Of course, in doing this, though, there's uh, uh, significant questions that, uh, uh, that, that you occur, that you um, run into with regard to the biocompatibility 
in the bio biodegradability of the platform. So in some cases, uh, some of these particle cores right, can be biodegradable. You can use polymers that the body can naturally break down. In other cases, you use gold nanoparticles, as I mentioned before, that aren't biodegradable. And the question is, what is the fate of those uh, materials when injected into cells or in vivo systems? And those are all questions that uh, are unraveling and people are beginning to understand in the context of making new drugs, for instance, out of, uh, of these uh, nanoparticles. I talked about drug loading and target loading, uh, drug and targeting uh, loading into a nanostructure. They can be encapsulated in the core of the particle. They can be attached to the surface. And people have become very sophisticated, and I'll show you a few examples of ways that you can actually use the particle to only release cargo, for instance, in the presence of an external stimulus uh, in, the, in the tumor, for example, where you'd like the drug to be released. But first, we'll give an example of a diagnostic. And so this diagnostic uh, was uh, a very interesting example. It was developed here at Northwestern. Uh, and this is one of the very first examples of translational nanotechnology. Um, so it's a very simple idea. Uh, and this was done in, in Chad Merkin's laboratory uh, in 1995, 1996. Uh, and what they did was the following. They said, initially, that gold nanoparticles are very interesting structures, right? They have a very strong interaction with light. There's that red color that I told you about before. That's the same nanoparticle that are in st stained glass windows and uh, cathedra cathedrals that are thousands of years old, uh, and it stays there forever, right? They're very stable. Um, structures and they interact with light in a very brilliant way. But the problem with just these nanoparticles is that you can't do anything with them, right? You can't manipulate them and put them, for instance, where you want to put them, right? And so the Merkin group at the time said, well, we have a way that we can begin to program the assembly of these inert uh, nanostructures, right? And one of the ways is we can put DNA on the surface. So, of course, everybody in the room is familiar with DNA and the hybridization events that happen with complementary strands of DNA. And they said, we can use DNA as a glue uh, to hold together these nanoparticle bricks. And so that's what they did. They started with these two populations of nanoparticles. They have this A sequence, this is a DNA sequence, a B sequence on the surface of another set of particles. The A and the B are not complementary to one another, so when you mix them in solution, they freely float around uh, and they don't bind to one another. However, if you take a sequence A prime, B prime, right, this sequence is the A prime is complementary to the A, the B prime is complementary to the B. And that then, the DNA hybridization event, brought the nanoparticles together and assembled them in a rational way. Rational meaning you can change the sequence of DNA uh, so that you can assemble them with other partners, particles with larger sizes, anything you wanted. It gave you a glue that you could program to hold together these particles. And the interesting thing that happened when they ran this experiment was when the particles assembled, they turned purple. And I know that blows your hair back, uh, and it blew their hair back at the time. Actually, they didn't understand uh, what the heck was going on. But the neat part was, and the reason it blows your hair back, is because they instantly went from, we're going to assemble nanostructures with a DNA linker, right? Just assemble nanoparticles and use the DNA as a glue, to this DNA is not a linker anymore. This DNA sequence is a target, right? We want to diagnose uh, a disease where we know a specific nucleic acid sequence may be present in a diseased versus a healthy sample, right? And we can do that very, very easily. We take the sample we, that we're curious about, we take the sample, we dunk it into a set of nanoparticles that we've tailored, right, we've put together that will recognize that sequence. And if it's there, it'll aggregate and it'll turn purple, which is exactly what they did and was exactly what they started doing um, in order to develop a diagnostic out of the very simple hybridization event that took place in the presence of a target DNA sequence. Uh, what you see here is just the melting profile. So if you, if you, if you add the DNA sequence, the particles aggregate. There's very little absorbance, uh, but if you melt them apart, uh, you can see that you see this nice sh sharp melting transition between uh, the DNA holding together these new uh, nanoparticles. You can also see that this melting transition takes place over a very narrow uh, size, uh, excuse me, temperature range, uh, so that if you go up even just one degree, right, you go from aggregated particles to dispersed particles, meaning that the diagnostic is extremely specific for the sequence that you're looking for. So that's one example. All right, here's a second example of a diagnostic uh, nanoparticle. Again, gold, uh, to keep everybody on the same page. So this is a very interesting example where the nanoparticles, right, the properties of the nanoparticles are used to quench fluorescence. So this is called the nanoflare. Uh, and you'll hear about nanoflares uh, in, in a coming talk. Here's a gold nanoparticle. It has a DNA sequence on the surface. And here there's another DNA sequence uh, that's hybridized uh, to the sequence that's stuck down on the surface of the particle. 
and the red ball is a molecular fluorophore. The molecular fluorophore, when in close proximity to the gold, is quenched, so the fluorescence is quenched. Um, you can take these particles then, and in solution or in living cells, you can give these particles, the particles enter the cells, they encounter, for instance, messenger RNA targets in the cell cytoplasm, and when they do that, they bind in complementary fashion to the sequence on the surface uh, and kick off a nanoflare, right? And so when the nanoflare is removed from the particle, it turns on, the, the quenching of fluorescence is no longer present, uh, and you can see it inside of the cells. So here's an example of how that works, uh, or here's an example of that working. Uh, so this is a, a breast cancer cell line, and we've added uh, scrambled nanoflares. So the sequence on the surface of the particles doesn't recognize any messenger RNA, messenger RNA in the cell cytoplasm. To where over here, we've added a cancer gene. Uh, we've, we've added nanoflares that target a specific gene we know that's expressed inside of these cancer cells. Uh, and you can see they light up like crazy, right? They release the molecular fluorophore and they're very easy to detect, and they're also non-toxic to the cells. You can see that the morphology of these cells is very similar to these cells, right? And normal cells, even though I don't have an untreated sample up there, you just have to take my word for it, right? And then we can then isolate those cells that light up uh, for that specific fluorescent signal. How about drugs? So those are a couple examples of diagnostics. Uh, how about drugs, right? And so uh, one of the things that we have to keep in mind, and I mentioned it earlier, right, is we have scaffolds now. We have particles that are sitting at most of the core or that the particle is in fact made of. They're polymers, metal nanoparticles, lipids, etc. And the question is, how does size, shape, surface chemistry, surface charge, all those things, how does that, how is that uh, impact for instance, the pharmacokinetics of the material if you inject it into, in, into a living system. And so there's been some rules uh, that have been generated over the course of time. You know, the charge uh, of the particle uh, is extremely important with regard to its uh, pharmacokinetics. The size, as you go from a one nanometer particle to, for instance, a 220 nanometer particle, the body deals with those uh, different sizes in, much different way, in many different ways. Hydrophobicity, how sticky is the particle? And again, all of these things combine to give you ultimately uh, the behavior of the drug in a, in a biological system. And each nanoparticle platform is unique. So each one needs to be studied uh, you know, individually to really to come up with exactly how it behaves. There are some design rules. So very, very small particles, right? Small, small particles, um, you know, less than 10 nanometers. They're filtered at the level of the kidney, oftentimes, and they found in the urine. So they have a very short, for instance, circulating half-life. Uh, 40 to 50 nanometer particles, cells tend to like those with regard to wrapping the membrane around sizes of particles that are like that. And 100 nanometer particles tends to be a little bit too large. The reticulin to system, surveilling dendritic cells and macrophages, love pulling these things out of circulation and gobbling them up, whereupon their, their circulating half-life is extremely low. Slightly negative uh, particles or, or neutral particles, a little better than uh, to some degree positively charged particles where they can become cytotoxic. And that relates to the, cell ch the charge of a cell membrane versus the charge of the nanoparticle. Um, and the smaller the particles are, the less scavenged they are by the surveilling macrophages, the reticulum endothelial system. These are general rules, and of course, each individual particle needs to be studied in its own right. And so here's a couple of examples. I'll just th go through them very quickly of, of, of nanoparticles uh, that have, used and, uh, have been used in very interesting ways in, in order to deliver drug cargo. So here's a liposome. If they've taken this uh, amino acid zipper um, that, that reacts to increasing temperature so that they can release drug cargo inside of the liposome based upon an increase in temperature. Uh, doxorubicin is the, is the drug that's inside this nanoparticle. These are very interesting porous silica nanoparticles. Uh, so these are uh, 50 to 100 nanometers or so uh, in, in diameter. Uh, and they use alternating uh, magnetic currents ultimately to heat these particles uh, and then to release uh, magnetic particles that are inside of them uh, that carry nucleic acids. Here's another example of, of lysosomes, or excuse me, lipo liposomes, um, where they have cle uh, pH cleavable uh, linkers. So the particle engages uh, cancer cells. The pH of that uh, environment may be slightly less, more acidic uh, than otherwise, um, whereupon the ligands on the surface are cleaved, uh, the drug ligands on the surface are cleaved, so that they can then be delivered to, uh, specifically to the cancer cells in that uh, location. So gold nanoparticles, coming back to these, uh, many of you may have heard of these. So these are gold nano shells. Those shells that I showed before, about 150 nanometers in diameter. You can use near-infrared lights. So near-infrared lights, very good at penetrating tissues. You can activate this particle, for instance, to heat locally, right, to destroy cancer cells, and also to uh, release ligands. So if you heat the particle, 
DNA, of course, binds to itself, and there's a temperature transition uh, that occurs when it's bound and not bound. And so you can heat the particle locally. Wherever the particle is, you can heat it up uh, by shining near-infrared light on it, and then release uh, ligands that are on the surface of the particle, whether it's DNA uh, or proteins that you can release at the site just where you're shining that light, for instance, again, at an individual tumor, for instance. And so those are a few examples of ways uh, that people are using therapeutic nanoparticles. 